this morning we're going to open up, uh, Robert Champion's going to open up in our keynote presentation. Uh, Robert Champion is the CEO of Inaflex Solutions, a motivated and innovative technical leader working with OEMs and large CPG multinationals. Two decades of OEM experience working across food platforms, dry goods, dairy, fluids, confections, non-edibles, frozen, chilled, extended shelf life liquids, low and high speed automations, delivering to multinational. Boy, he kind of does it all there. <laughs> um, uh, in 10 plus years of CPG experience providing capital equipment systems and strategy for operations across multiple factories, work cross-functionally cross -functionally to drive down operational costs and increase line performance for innovative and renovations to our, for brands growth. Recently retired from Nestle, congratulations, uh, I've held the, uh, where he held the position of Group Packaging Equipment Engineering Manager for the U.S. market. Responsibilities covered all packaging capital investment systems across their wide varied businesses, beverages, prepared foods, ice cream, culinary, uh, professional and Canadian businesses. Supporting factories and manufacturing operations, technically and interacting across cross functionality. Led teams of senior engineering managers to support key business performance metrics on existing and new assets, collaborating externally and ensuring suppliers base transforms to their internal specifications for compliance to safe operation, operating equipment, food safety, cost performance, and ensuring quality of products produced on those assets all the time. Please help me in welcoming Robert Chan. First, thank Mela Toledo for inviting me, Vigo, and Kim for inviting me to this very awesome exchange. So I have a passion for people, I have a passion for industry, I have a passion for food, and I have a passion for excellence. I thought about something, what's really obvious in life, right? Think about the obvious stuff. This is just, this is not really funny, but you know, should it snow in the middle of fall in the Midwest with eight inches of snow? Should it? It's not really obvious, is it? But it happened. It happened Monday. And uh, the other obvious thing is my snowboard was not prepared for eight inches of snow. So we're shoveling snow. I'm out there, my wife's at work, she gets home, I got half the driveway done. I was hoping she was gonna come up because she's athletic. They helped me, she did, she parked her car, she got out, she snowed, shoveling, and I said, we're done. She said, no, we're not done, there's still more to do. She's more anal than I am as far as getting things done. So, you know, a lot of times, obvious things, and I'm gonna talk about that, that you assume are obvious, but not really obvious. So being prepared for the unobvious things are very, very important. So we're gonna to talk to you today about three things. And you know, Inflex Solution was a, is a derivative of what I've done in my 30 year career. So a lot was said about what I've done. This is my experiences in my career. And what I wanna do is share that out in the industry and, and just help OEMs and CPGs become better. So we already talked about who we are. You know, we're a solutions provider company. And why, that's why we're here. Part of our organization is technical speaking, is, is symposiums to get the message out. And that's uh, our other part of our business, and, and that's what we're doing today. So there's three major things we're going to talk about today. Three things I think are important. There's trends in the, that are impacting the food industry that I think all of us have, we're contributors to. We need to be aware of that. Then there's product that we as, I'm going to put my hat on as a CPG, right? So as a CPG, we're always trying to get that product out to market. And we need to get it out very fast now. I'm going to talk about that speed to market. And then the disruption that it causes us to get it out to market. And as Greg talked about yesterday, the technology and the quality team, the safety team yesterday and their message about getting it out safely, the validations, all these things are just added requirements that are needed, but they cause aggravation inside the CPGs. Then the third thing I'm going to spend most of my time on is the modes of operation and how all these things impact how we want to produce food and get it out the door. So, you know, we talked about the obvious, and what the obvious really is, is the consumer. It's the customer. The reason why we're in business is to deliver a product or a commodity to feed the world, to feed consumers. If you're not doing that as your main purpose, close your doors. Profits are a byproduct of doing the right thing. Growth is a byproduct of doing the right thing. Yeah? So now I'm going to talk about a few companies and, and, and as I drive through this, but consumers and, and customers, they're the king. Yeah? So Walmart, the Kroger's, the big retail stores, and the Amazons, they're the customer. Let's call them the customer in our CPG world. The consumers who they serve. We are all consumers, yes? And I'm going to say there's three main norms in this whole paradigm that we want to talk about, and they are harmonizing the supply system. So you've heard about technology, blockchain, and the Internet of Things, and 
digitalization. At the end of the day, it's about ensuring good food from being produced to the store shelves and doing it on time, on budget, that, that tastes good, that meet all the internal d d drivers of an organization. So that's what the technology means to me. So when a, when a uh, customer comes into me, a, a commodity supplier, equipment supplier, my first question to them is, what's your value proposition to help me win? And if an OEM does not know their value proposition, they need to go back and rethink about why they should do business with a big CPG. That's the very first question I ask. Not price, not your show, sales stuff, but what's your value proposition? So let's talk about vision and mission statements. So there's a few I pulled off, and you probably can't read it, but Nestle talks about health and wellness, nutrition, eating, good life from morning till night, feeding you, so you're always buying their brands. I say our brands, but now it's their brands, yeah? So these, this is important, vision, to be leading, nutrition, health, wellness. We talked about all these things yesterday, probiotics yesterday, about all that, what's needed, Greg had his thoughts about that. But it's all about getting the products on shelf on time to the consumer. And General Mills, a simple one. We want to make good food serving the world by changing values and making it powerful. ConAgra, this is their statement. We want to energize our brands, great food, great margins, consistent. It's all about food, it's all about the customer and consumer. So this to me is the reason why when I talk about more about this presentation, dive into the details, is focus on this mission and vision. This is what we should do and why we should do it. So major trends impacting the food industry. There are really a few. Uh, there's SKU proliferation. So as a CPG, what's happening to us is we're being asked to create more of, of different types of products and to do it quicker, yeah? And to do smaller sizes. So instead of running continuously for 200 a minute, we, we need 50 a minute, and we need to run a small batch of those that, that run per day. And the factories and the lines were never designed to run that way. And the people that run these lines are aggravated because they just want to come in, clock in, turn the machine on, have no downtime, keep running, and be excellent. So SKU proliferation looks like this, right? So it used to be you get one product, now you've got these other derivatives of that product that you need to run and, and you have to manage for that. The other one is smaller SKUs. So traditionally, it used to be bulk, build for brick and mortar, get it out the door, shipping cases, deliver it out, and, and everybody's happy. Well, Walmart and Kroger now says we want smaller size cases, we want this many in a case, and we want to only put this on the case one time. We don't want to take it to the back of the store, have labor bring it back to the floor, they want to reduce their labor costs, and we want it on the shelf so when we put it on there, it's already in the right configuration. Yeah? That aggravation to a CPG means that on the front end of their factory where they produce the product at the same rate, they're not throttling that down because it's an aggravation to the processing. They have to add more equipment on the packaging side to take now smaller pack formats in factories that were never designed to handle more lines. Compounding that is safety. So now you're talking about safety of people, logistics of getting materials into that factory. You talk about all your components that you sell, lots of CPGs, X-ray system, metal detectors. It just creates a maze on the floor. So all this is being pushed down because who wants it? The consumer. Consumer is key. So to play with them, these are the things you need to do. So you look at the next quick brand, I just threw it up there. Yeah, it used to be a case of them, now it's a case of two, a case of four, a case of six. Display ready case, being on the, on the, the, on the dry goods shelf in a certain format, a different case style that did not exist. So you've got case material development, you've got product downsizing, and then you've got the equipment proliferation of trying to fit it in. So, and then you've got competition and compressed cycles. This is a real challenge for CPGs. So the story set shelf cycle, and most, you probably know this, used to be like July in most traditional stores, retail, uh, twice a year, something like that. We've been told it's almost, it's, it's moving quarterly. So that means your equipment sales to us needs to be faster. You need to compress your internal manufacturing. You need to disrupt yourself because the consumer is disrupting the whole, whole ecosystem. What do you think? You think that's true, or you think I'm just blowing smoke? <laughs> that's a question. What do you think? Sounds true to me. Are you impacted by any of this? Does this have you been impacted by any of this? 
When you come in and talk to your, your key clients, do they mention you got to reduce your delivery timelines? Sure. What's your response to them? <laughs> we'll, we'll do it for... And then change for 20 years. Hasn't changed. I don't think I've ever had a machine reorder where somebody said you got to do it faster. Yeah, it's slow. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, this is the real world. It's, kind of, it's competition is, is really, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that to the other slide. So you've got in, in this aggravation of new food forms being launched, that big food companies are trying to play in that field. And the way that we do it is we either buy those companies, we, 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 we do a partnership with them to, to learn, let them incubate, let them do what they do well, and we upsize and bring them into our main factories and launch. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The other one is, I'm going to call the QOR, uh, uh, cost of quality, um, revenue, cost of revenue, quality of their revenue in, in the TCO, to, uh, total uh, cost of ownership. So who knows what QOR, total uh, quality of revenue, really means? Okay. So I just learned about that myself. What it means is, for a CPG to invest their money, so put your financial hat on now. This is another thing you need to understand. Inside CPGs, everyone's thinking about finance. All the meetings, people are talking about the numbers. One way, one form or the other, it's about the numbers. Because the performance of a production line, there's cost of goods sold, and we all need to understand if, and I'll talk more about this, what's prohibiting meeting those goals from a performance standpoint? So we talk about, so quality revenue means where you invest your money, where it, the return of that revenue isn't like, let me phrase it another way. It's not like acquiring a lot of cash, generating a lot of revenue. It's the quality of the revenue, so your cost to produce that good is of, you meet your margins. So you're not producing, you're not investing a lot of capital and to, internal costs to create that revenue. So it's money that has high bit margins. So quality of revenue, we start asking ourselves, should we invest? and this type of equipment from this company to, to do what we want done to launch this brand. So I want to talk about product development, speed, and quality to market. So here we talked about the consumers pulling, wanting it. Now we're moving, just, we're just moving down in the equation. Now it's about how do we develop and get it to the market and what's aggravating us from doing it. This is not a negative presentation. I'm not trying to give you a zoom and gloom, but it's about really what's going on. You really want to know what's going on, right? Yeah. That's why you brought me here, so I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay. Product development and speed quality. Uh, let's just let's go out. So these are, there's three, two or three things here that are really impacting that food companies and it impacts OEMs. It's innovation and renovation of brands. I work for one big CPG, and uh, it was a Kellogg company. And I was so impressed working for them. At when I worked for them, was their innovation and renovation pipeline. When a, when a project failed because it didn't meet the financial hurdles or the in-home HUD, I had test, in-home use test, consumers said, nah, it didn't taste good, we don't like it, the panel said we didn't like it. They were ready to launch a new brand, a new product, a derivative of that in months. We knew what factory, we knew what line, we knew how much it cost to launch. That's why. They, when I were there, they were very good at getting new stuff on the shelf very fast. If you looked at their product line on Special K brand and the other brands, they launched quickly. Not everybody can do that. Um, so brand innovation, renovation, so they always had the consumer engaged. They kept like an engaged consumer. I just pulled this off the internet. You see things like this with a pouch with some, looks like you can heat or warm something up with a straw in it. Maybe that's coffee, maybe it's some beverage, but there's some unique things happening. But the most important thing is the pipeline here. So if you look at this pipeline, this is how it really works. There's a lot of stuff going in, there's stuff coming out, but a lot of stuff coming out doesn't stick. And I'll talk about why it doesn't stick inside the operations. The next is food development. So we're all impacted by this. I'm, I love this next piece here. So you talk about plant-based foods, right? Okay. You talk about who, who likes plant-based burgers? <coughs> Have you tried them? Who's tried them? Okay. <laughs> Who's tried the, 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 the Whopper from Burger King? What do you think about that? Tastes just like it. Uh, 
Okay. So, <laughs> so I had a colleague of mine, true story, I won't mention the company's name, that came up and we had these annual visits, these frequent visits. He said, let's go out and let's have a burger. And he said, uh, by the time, he said, before I left, he said, by the way, it's not a beef burger. I said, oh, okay, okay, I'll go and I'll try it. So he said, it's a, it's a veggie-based burger. And I was a little, ah, oh, man, I'm hungry, you want me to eat some? I don't like the vegetable stuff. It just doesn't taste good, the, the old stuff. So I had the, the, the burger, it was cooked at a gourmet restaurant, a little one of these specialty restaurants. And I couldn't tell the difference between that and a beef burger. So that turned me on from that point on. So I started selling a message to my mother, who's a diabetic, to, you know, help her eat better. That mom, why don't you try this burger, opposed to there's another company, I won't mention their name, that's been on the market with plant-based burger that tastes like a frozen burger, which you don't want to eat. So what I'm getting at, so here's the deal now. I'm giving you a long story to say that you've got Impossible Burger, you've got Beyond uh, Burger, and Nestle just launched this. I forgot the name. It's going to launch in January. This is not a negative to Nestle, so if you hear this, do not ding me for this. <laughs> too late, too slow, in my opinion. But their target market isn't restaurants. I mean, it isn't consumers, retail. It's restaurants. And the reason why it's restaurants is because they have a very big business called Nestle Professional, which is already set to deliver products to those targeted customers. So my point is, this stuff is happening, but what's the impact to the production line to produce this? Does anyone know? Is the density the same? Is the food form and processing the same? Is the packaging the same? Are the oils inside the food, the fat the same? Does it seal the same? Does it behave the same on equipment? No. So, again, and I'm going to show you the very interesting slide, the impact to performance and consumer, they want it, if we can't get it on a shelf, what good is it? The other one is product development, speed, and quality. We talk about packaging formats. <clears throat> this is a, a big disruption here, also. So I led a team at Nestle. Uh, Walmart came in last year, last year, 2017. They said, we want display-ready cases. We want so many in a case. And we want the machines, like, less than a year. So the OEMs that we bid it out to were like, how are you going to do that? More importantly, we didn't have a case design to meet the requirement. So we're, we're doing parallel engineering, material development, case, just, you know, case uh, material development, machine to be able to do it, turning the, the, the cartons a certain orientation because the facing had to be presentable in the case. So anytime in packaging 101, anytime you leave, on the, don't handle the product, it's, it's at risk for jams or inefficiencies. You want to keep control of the all the way through the process. But when you turn and do all these other things, you induce a, a potential downtime events. And your throughput goes down. So just a little bit. So e-commerce and omnichannels, I'm going to talk about that. That's another a big player. How are these companies going to deliver to brick and mortar, deliver to a specialty channel, deliver to uh, uh, e-commerce out of the same factories and or the, uh, their co-packers or co-manufacturers. And deliver the packaging with integrity at the same time being sustainable, reducing material. So there's a lot going on in this space. This is interesting. This is a manufacturing, not just something, like, this is really, this, this looks stupid, doesn't it? But originally, this is called this manufacturing facility where you produce product, uh, production, Processing and, and packaging, it traditionally has a, a clear path to, to where we're going to go next, which is the factory, warehouse distribution centers, customer stores, out to the supply chain. Traditionally, it's easy. This is what's happening today. We're being impacted by e-commerce, different packaging formats, so we talk about smaller SKUs. We're also being impacted, as I said earlier, by innovation, renovations, sustainability, and packaging <coughs> materials. There's a lot of development around pack, smart packaging. I was talking to the young lady here, we talked about smart packaging. And the impact of that, traceability, uh, food, uh, helping food, uh, the life, understanding food better through packaging by giving off some, some indicators that something's going on in the packaging. All right, so there's a lot going on uh, that we need to consider. But this is really today, 
the new world. This is where I live day to day. The new disruption is, if you want e-commerce, here's how it really works. I'm gonna summarize it for you. So I've got a production line that runs a dedicated set of SKUs, and it runs at a certain speed. Now I want to run e-commerce, which is small quantity packages. Where, how am I going to get it off the line and get it to where I want to produce it? So a lot of them use the word parent-child. So what we've looked at, one of the major projects I had before I left, was to look at how we can get play into these other areas of distribution and what that playbook looked like as far as equipment lands. So if we talk about, let me give you some technologies that the CPGs are looking at. So depending, I don't use a brand called, uh, I won't mention it, but just frozen foods or meals. Those factories are older. There's dedicated paths from like the freezer to packaging. And there's some reasons why you don't take the product offline in certain places. But to do e-commerce, you've got to take that product somewhere and get it from up a level up above the floor where it's probably coming out of the freezer down to a location you're going to put it either in whip and do repacking, now it's frozen now, in a controlled environment in your factory, or you're gonna put it on a reef or something and send it to a co-packer to do it. So here's the situation. So what happens is, you have to be creative. And this is where it causes unplanned downtime and aggravation to production, right? You need to be able to take the product and put it in with, and here's where technology takes place. You say, can I do this with manual labor, the repacking? Do I use robots? Do I use cobots? And what about the safety of all that? Do I make it a mobile line, a modular line? This is when I talk to OEMs. Do you have the capability for some modularization for a CPG to act like a co-packer? Nimble, quick, because we can't get the shelf unless we, have, we start thinking like they do. So we, we came up with some, like, some, some solutions looking at these technologies, and then the price of entry isn't that bad anymore to get in the game, isn't that bad. So let me give you another story. Suppliers coming in to offer me solutions in this space were very few. There are companies that sell robots, they sell cobots, they sell conveyors, but no one was able to come and say, this is what it looks like for you, understanding the way our factories run, the way our people, how they are trained, how our processes operate. There's some unique processes in some of the food manufacturing facilities. But there is a space where no one's really coming in and helping us as food companies really understand how we can win with consumers in this disruptive space. So again, this looks crazy, but this is kind of some of the older factories are like this. They go around things, they go up, they come down. But again, this is really what we need help. CPGs need help from companies like that are sitting here and your expertise in food safety. You know, it's, you know how can you, we do this and be, have quality food, safe food, safe people running these pieces of equipment and make a profit? Does that make any sense or am I all, all over the map here? You so, so are you saying that the decisions, that the decisions would be made uh, not really at the OEM level, but more the integration company or the engineering company that can take the whole entire project and take all the OEMs and put them together and make that line work? Or is it is it not as sexy as it used to be to work directly with OEMs, are you saying, kind of? Well, this in the real world, there's gaps seen with uh, just, when I canvass different companies, yeah. there are gaps with talent. Yeah. There are people retiring and it's not, to fill that gap, pull back the right talent, it's not easy. Uh, there are not a lot of people coming back in traditional manufacturing, they want to do some of the programming and coding, but not so much the, the integration. But I, I say there's opportunities for integrators and OEMs to, to get better integrated, talk about that, and to go to an OEM, excuse me, a consumer food group company and, and provide some solutions. The very first thing I would say is understand how the factories operate. Does that answer your question? Yes. Most of operators, to ensure food safety, quality and production lines need to not stop. Good luck. And the reason I say that is it's because of the rapid changeovers, the sharp SKUs. And those they, are planned. The, even if they're planned, they're there are cost. Yes. Because then you gotta clear the line clearance, you gotta clean, you gotta do all the things to make sure that the next one you produce on that line is the quality you want, yes. not the quality of the last one you 
do. Exactly. So you're exactly right. So when you go through any interruption, but an unplanned, which is a breakdown event, which is an abnormality that you don't, you're not aware of, you have no controls over, that are impacting your line. We know from data that we've seen quality issues because of unplanned interventions in the line, maintenance interventions to get in the clear jam, tools and things of that nature, grease on tools and over primary un primary packaging before it's a seal on it or in a park. Yeah? That it induces potential for and people not thinking top of mind, get it in, get it out, keep that line running. So line stop just to zero. This is a dream. It's like, you gotta have zero, you have to go for the gusto. Line stop just to zero. Align modes of operation. This is the one I think gets most of uh, OEMs in trouble. If I leave with anything today, I'm gonna ask you to really go into your customer and you ask them, what are your modes of operation of your production line? Every shift, what does that look like? If you wanna be successful, I'm giving you the secret sauce. You, you don't only just sell what they tell you they want, you ask them, be inquisitive. What's going on with this line? What happens when you run these particular bright SKUs? And then how do you run it? Why am I saying this? There are routines that happen that you need to be aware of. Like offline quality checks. Yeah, They do offline weight checks, offline whatever. They'll put the pack on some the right way, some the wrong way. And I was talking to you earlier about what that means to you. You probably don't know this. In our data system, which is not very, it needs to be improved, I'm going to be positive. The data systems that a lot of the companies have that are not really uh, digital in the true sense of what I'm talking about, what they are, just a, a, a collection of histor historical events. And what we do is, and I'm going to be, we take that information and we look, and from an engineering standpoint, we'll look at our biggest bottlenecks, our the, the pieces of equipment that shuts the line down the most. And what I was charged to do was go after improving those assets one way or the other with the supplier. To get it done now because we need to run more volume off these lines. The assets are paid for and let's utilize, get that other 20% of throughput if we're at you know 60%, I need more out of those. So we looked at the, the data, but the data is not coded correctly. It was a checkware failure. It was not the checkware. It was the conveyor before the checkware. But it was so close to the checkware, the data said checkware issues. So we were going after the wrong thing. Yeah? And here, where are you at? Right here. We've had conversations when I was in Solar. Did we talk <coughs> something about this when we talked about improving? I asked you to go out and your team to go out and look at improving. We did, yeah? We did, yeah. So where I'm getting, modes of operation will save you a lot of headaches. Digitalization at the data at the data at the operator. <clears throat> There's a term used in some of the big companies, connected worker. What it simply says is your iPhone, your iPad are with these people all the time now. Let's be able to get that, you know, those faults and trends on their phones so they can immediately react. Not a day from now, not when they do the DOR, the daily operational review, or WOR weekly or monthly review. You need to do it instantaneously. At least, at least, so one of the great things I saw yesterday on the <coughs> hands-on Metler Toledo stuff, the tour, was being able to go in and, and access and see some of that data. I did make a comment about one of the um, checkware that it shouldn't say uh, packaging maintenance. I did not understand that. The feature to go in and put in and config configure the packaging for, you know, in the template, it said, like, what is that maintenance? It should say packaging configuration because you're configuring a packaging format. Now, I'm done doing maintenance. So my point is, you know, and I'm veering a little bit, digitalization is very important. Digitalization down the right way. Here's another one that I know you know about, but I'm not sure we really follow this when we go on. Variation in food and packaging materials also impact performance on production lines. So you have your upper control limit, your lower control limit on some of the, the statistics on your uh, your diagnostic equipment, and x-rays, and metal detector checkware. Yeah, and okay, I won't get to that level of detail. But the variation, here's what goes on. In the real world, there are tweaks made on shifts to let it run. No one knows about it. It runs well on their shift, but we they call corporate in, 
It's not running good on second shift and our numbers are down. Send your SWAT team in here and help fix it. We send tons of people to go and fix something that's really simple. Process indicators are not at the operator screen or a uh, red indicator when it's out or green so that, yeah, they may have the power to tweak it a little bit because it's running on a high side, but we need to know that at the operator level. Yeah. And then PDA, product defect analysis, done quickly in minutes. So the data, you know the traditional PDA is an after review. I want PDAs done immediately on the floor. So if I've got that data on my iPhone, I can see track and train, oh, this line is, oh, it had it, this minute is doing this, maybe I need to get maintenance ready. There's something that doesn't look right. So I'm doing a PDA or a 5Y or fishbone, all these demand, all these things that you do to problem solve, I can start doing that quicker. The whole treat, the game is to be able to keep the, pro the line running and get the product to the consumer and keep our costs low <clears throat> to do that. In a traditional model, and I can tell you something else, that in big food companies, there's great cost pressures to reduce internal operating costs. Labor. Big food companies have a major labor budget. The owners of the company, the CEOs and the, the, the uh, C-suites, they're putting tremendous pressure on the operating divisions and factories to get that labor cost down. From buying parts to service, that's where digitalization plays in. Can it offset where the value of these companies, where they're trying to go, can it offset to what their drivers are? And I'm, talking, I'm getting ahead of myself. Digitalization has to have value to me. It has to do something that's going to add one or two things, bring my costs down or increase my profits. Other than that, tell me all the stories you can, but if it's not doing those two things, let's not talk. So here's some interesting data I pulled off from Deloitte, uh, just some industry stuff on data. And uh, what I want to point to is this is the most important to me in my area. It's, that it's noted. And I can say this is actually true in five years or less, so 2025, 2024, that most companies are saying they're embracing digitalization. The struggle is who do you buy from? What do you do with it? Are you buying sensors? Are you taking those sensors on your pieces of equipment to do thermal loading to make sure it's healthy when a machine's running or whatever? Uh, whatever the, the different uh, sensor, sensor device is doing, tracking, what value is it doing to bring your cost down? And then at the end of the day, what this allows us to do is to make decisions to do X, do something different. I can make a decision based upon the data I'm getting to either buy parts or do unconsigned, right? So why am I inventorying all this, these just hedging parts in my, in my, in my stores when I know if I can track and turn it, I can say, you know what? If you want to be a partner with us, you need to start storing these parts on your side of the wall, paying your taxes on your side. You need to get healthy. And now I know when I'm going to need them. I want them here two weeks before I need them. That's the real world that's happening. It's going to happen to you. Some of the simplest things are bought by CPGs. I want to ask you a couple questions. There's two key components in industrial equipment that food companies buy a lot of the package. Let's just say package. I'm going to give you a test. What do you think they are? There's two components, two pieces of hardware that they buy the most of. Case and English. No, that's total. Downsize it to components that are on those pieces of equipment. Just what do you mean? Motors. Motors are one. Bearings. Bearings is the other. Oh, they only cost a bearing 12 bucks, right? A motor, 200 bucks. But the downtime to get in and put it in is exponentially higher. And the loss opportunity on sales of products are exponentially higher. And for me to be disruptive, and I showed you in an earlier uh, layout, I can't compete quicker to be on shelf to do the plant-based foods because my machines are not ready to rock and roll. It's all about excellence. Yeah. Digitalization. So you talk about stuff in cloud, MES, stuff at the factory floor. Um, what it really boils down to this, <coughs> this is what I believe is what's required for most food companies. You need devices that can tell me what's going on, real-time monitoring and feedback. I don't need everything up in the cloud. I need it at the floor level, on a PC on the floor, and that same data replicated back on my phone. So at the very least, the very starting point. So think about the equipment you're selling 
does it have enough diagnostics to help a CPG not to spend extra money on maintenance? Solve my problem. Data center, so you get it out of, you know, in visualization. The other thing I'm gonna show you, we talked to you, the layout I showed you with all the curves, and I said that the flow was straight. Well, you know what's helping to offset a lot of that is autonomously guided vehicles, AGVs. Real life story. One of the major projects I worked on before I left was a very interesting project, was putting AGVs in a factory that was 50 years old. Not designed for it, no room, and I won't talk about the process, but there's a certain process that would bring certain, there was batch mode, bringing this product out this time, you do something else, so you have a lot of forklift trucks. You had operators with forklifts running around the floor, the floors are uneven, congested factory, and someone said, we can save money. We're not reducing labor in the sense, but we're gonna utilize the labor where it's value added by putting smart robots <coughs> on the floor to carry some goods to the production line. We were like, wow, are you serious? The floor is uneven, it's a, it's a dairy brick floor, there's water on the floor, but you know, by working with the technology company and understanding how they do it, and success stories and walking through it with them and our modes of operation, they were able to push that project through with a hurdle rate for payback. Untraditional, there's no way this would normally happen. So this is technology that, so the Wi-Fi system had to be improved, all these things, but this, this is some, these are some of the key things that are happening to allow you to be disruptive. So modes of operation digitalization. This is my, my one statement I want to leave you. Digitalization technology for the purpose of new trends and uh, uh, they had no value to me. For me, I'm just coining my own phrases. It keeps the normal at norm if, if once the norm is true. What does that mean? The data may not be good at data. Get the data right, so once the data is right, then you can add technology. Or get the maintenance right. Then you add the devices. And then once those changes, it changes the abnormal to normal and can enable continuous improvement. So by adding sensors and devices and equipment, I'm continuously improving. So now I have a, a, a real trend of what's going on. You know what I do? This is another thing that we've been asked to do. We've been asked to, okay, let's reduce the our turn on buying certain parts. Let's go back to the distributors and force these distributors to redesign these parts <laughs> so that I'm not being impacted by downtime. If you don't do that, some, some suppliers won't change. So if you want continuous improvement, get the data to drive the change. So I can go back and say, now I need you to redesign the motor, the front seal and the motor's failing because of our wash down, and I need you to do some, oh, we have a solution. We just, well, why didn't you, you know, I'm helping them disrupt and change their business model, working with me, being proactive, and coming in on a frequent basis, sharing what, what they can do to help improve my situation, understanding my modes of operation. Yeah? So this is interesting, I think. So I took that, I started thinking, I think it was good. So you've got a connected ecosystem, right? You've got all these contributors to the consumer. And I won't read the text underneath, but there's some value things that they're driving in. Differentiation, different, differentiation on shelf, lower costs, technology, consumers are changing, baby boomers, etc. All that's happening. This is the real world. There's a missing component here. There's a lot impacting the business. A lot impacting the business. The missing link that what happens are these are the abnormalities that happen day to day, right? Errors and omission. I read a, a census, a U.S. census uh, statistics, and I'm Quoting, I hope I got my memory right here. The, the capital capex spend globally for capital equipment, whether it's food or industrial, is almost a trillion dollars. It's 2017. You can pull that yourself, right? 970 some odd billion. For used assets, it was like 53 billion. No, that's great for the economy. But the compelling part to me that impacted me was there was seven billion dollars annually in errors and emission. That means what you bought, someone made mistakes on both sides. Food companies, the suppliers, OEMs, the integrators. Everyone were making mistakes because let me give you another norm that's an abnormal. 
the expectation is 100% of what we buy. That back can just be done. We expect vertical startups. What do you think the percentage of vertical startups are, and Glenn and I talked about this last night, are for food companies? What do they say they are? Or what percentage. Are they, what are they real? I know, but you, what do you think they are? <laughs> I, mean, I still have a relationship with Nestle, I can't, you know. I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> what do you think? 20, 25%? Hmm. Anyone else? 2%. Come on, be real. Come on, what do you think? We, nobody would be in business, that's the case. We need to fire everyone. What do you think? <laughs> Big goal is close, but it's a little bit higher. It's not that low. Hmm. Anyway, I don't know what the industry average I'm going to tell you what it, the range is. Probably 40, 50%. <clears throat> This means that the money that your organization is saying we want to invest in, in shareholders and you have stock pay companies, they're trusting you to deliver and you're not delivering to them on uh, what they're, you invest into the best of your organization. That's not even the worst. Seven billion, um, almost a trillion dollars, that's not even the worst. It doesn't call, take into consideration the lost production, lost sales. So what I'm saying as an ecosystem, and I think I'm done, is uh, we all need to uh, contribute. The last slide I had on there was a fun one. So Milton Burrow said, he said, if, uh, if a door basically doesn't exist between you and the people you're working with, create that door. Create that opportunity to have these dialogues. So if the CPG is not giving you enough information, create that dialogue. You need to be armed with what to go in and ask and say. So the secret sauce I gave you was go in and ask, what, you know, great to have this order, but man, can or woman, what's it, what's the modes of operation? Tell me more about it. I want to be a strategic partner long term. I want to know what you're going to do on your omni channels. What's your strategy? It's not confidential, they can tell you. Because you're asking to dig deeper so you can be a more effective partner with them. Yeah? So if the door doesn't exist, build one. So one of the reasons why, and you ask me, well, why did you retire? You're crazy. Why did you do that? You look like you could still be working for somebody. Yes, I could. The reason why, and this is a fact true, a lot of the companies we were working with coming in, we were repeating the same problems over and over. And it's like, wow, you know, let me try to go out and fix it. One man, one company can't, but the goal was, let me go out and try to impact and share that message about what both sides need. And for companies sitting here, to be better, you gotta create that door of opportunity. You gotta go in a different way. You gotta go in talking total cost of ownership, modes of operation, omni-channel, and hear what their problems are. Then go back and think about what can you do on your R&D side to play in that area if you're not in that R&D side, or would you be there if there's a big enough market for you to go and invest to help us solve those problems, and you will win. It's not on price, it's on TCO that you win.